Welcome to the podcast where we talk about all the things that are hidden in the shadows. This is Isaac, and on this bonus episode, I'm joined by Stephen and Leslie Shaw, authors of Who They Are and What Are They Up To, a pair, uh, book all about aliens, encounters, and stuff like that, um, along with being alien enthusiasts, along associated with the paranormal at the same time. Their own experiences, um, I guarantee, are going to interest us, that's for sure. How are you guys doing? We're good. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Cloth nope. Thor, huh? Have <laughs> your yeah. shirt. Your shirt, Cloth Thor. Oh, yeah. No, I, uh, I've been uh, Nordic uh, faith for the last couple of years, and my mom got me this shirt because uh, of the Father's Day shirt, so it's Father. Yeah. How cool <laughs> is that? That's great. Very clever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, uh, I remember listening to you guys on Tommy's podcast, uh, let's get freaky. And you guys actually, you know, asked to come on ours and I was like, oh yeah, I, I know who they are. Let's, let's bring them on. Cause, uh, they had a very interesting theories and stories and things that they learned when it comes to alien, uh, activity and abductions and, you know, uh, the stuff different around them. So I was like, I don't really well, we do dabble with alien stuff. I think we'll have a Alien Part 6 episode if we do another one. So we have done alien episodes in the past, but, you know, it's always nice to talk with aliens other than paranormal investigating paranormal stuff. So, um, but it seems you were telling me beforehand you guys have been involved with the paranormal before? Yes. Oh, yeah. For my, my mostly uh, my entire life and going back three generations in my family bloodline. Actually, really four family bloodlines, but primarily the... Uh, the Newmans, Shaws, Rose, and a little bit of the uh, the Griffiths from uh, from starting from Germany, going into England, and then to into uh, the United States. Do you come from family generations of psychics? Uh, yes, pretty much. Very much. Uh, so. yes. At least on one side of the family. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, the Newmans down to the Rose, and then and then myself as a Shaw. They were automatic writers. Uh, for three generations, in fact, four generations now that uh, Stephen's sister has picked it up as well. And my sister has decided to finally start to to use it because, you know, she had her, you know, she didn't want to. She was a born again Christian for uh, quite a number of years, and she didn't want to be involved in what she knew and what yeah. we knew about the She's family. Like, this isn't happening. This is yes. Happening. <laughs> so, but the talent is there. I have the talent too if I want to use it, but I do not want to use it. I just. Uh, I the automatic not. writing. I, I, yeah, yeah I, I do. I do other things besides that. Right. So. Well, well, my knowledge of psychic mediums, because my wife, my co-host Megan, she is a very talented psychic medium. Automatic writing is like one of the many gifts that you can or possible doing, along with, um, you know, clairvoyance, clairaudience, and uh, ability to hear or feel the emotions being empathic and stuff like that. So you're saying your mm -hmm. family focused strictly on the automatic writing side of the cycle. Oh, right? no, there's clairaudience and uh, clairvoyance. And I've had uh, basically a uh, precog happen a couple times. And I astral mean, projection. Oh, and astral projection is, is like easy. That. That's, that's, that's not a big deal. It's just, you no, know, for me, it's, you know, because I taught Tai Chi and I did Tai Chi for many, many years, um, it really helped to uh, enhance a lot of those uh, abilities that we as humans do have inherent. We have the ability to do things like, you know, astral projection, to do, um, you know, a paranormal kind of type stuff, you know, like clear, hear things like, for instance, I used to be able to hear radio stations like a talk show host, two talk show hosts. Uh, when I would like uh, relax in the afternoon in my mid twenties, after working a hard day, I would just relax in my room, and it would be as if I was listening to a talk show with two DJs and with music in the background, and there was no music on the house. <laughs> and this is the thing that I would that I it would be a common thing for me to do. Yeah, you know, I could repeat right. it. I would go repeat it every time. So, but you know, this this whole thing as far as we grew up, I grew up at, from the age of three knowing that we had this family spirit guy called old Glegley that would help out people in the family and visit certain people in the family in times of need. And I just grew up just, you know, just knowing that. So when I was at the age of three, I would be visited from time to time in the middle of the night by this little entity that would be about the size of a cat that I couldn't see visually, but would jump on my chest, and my stomach, just kind of playing with me. And I thought, well, this is kind of fun. You know, it's not menacing. And I just 
just accepted it. So then about the age of nine, I had this experience where I was sleeping in the top of a bunk bed. My brother, who's six years younger than me, was sleeping on the bottom. And I was awakened by this really strange sound that I didn't recognize. And I, I knew it wasn't the family dog, but I was, I was curious. So I got out of the bed, again, middle of the night, and I walked down the, uh, the hallway. And my heart was pounding. I was definitely scared. I was literally, you know, in adrenal mode as I call it. And I just was really not expecting to, I did not know what I was going to see. And before I got around the corner, I just black out. And next thing I know, I'm back in bed about two or three hours later with, um, with no knowledge of what happened. Yes. We found this to be the case with the family in general, where they'd, they'd have these bizarre experiences, see something completely strange and be frightened by it. And yet suddenly black out and wake up three hours later tucked into bed or with no memory of what happened in between. And we have since in our research discovered this is the signature for the abduction phenomenon. And um, in Philip's case, uh, my younger brother, they, they tend to come in clusters, these experiences. And one time he, um, he had a cluster of three events in three nights. He was um, sleeping in his bedroom at their their central california home in sonora california yeah we were building a house so it was so they, they, you know, yeah, yeah the family was in two locations at the same time going back and forth and he was at the northern house and he he um he woke up with these bright white lights shining into his room and the uh his room uh right outside it had a uh, drop off of about 25 feet down to a creek and then across from there was a mountain with a forested mountain so there's no lights in the distance no homes no road or anything yeah very foresty area and he um he he's staring at these lights trying to figure out what he's looking at at age 16 i believe he was yes he was and 16. suddenly he blacks out and then the very next night he hears a weird scrabbling sound he's lying in bed and he reaches down to pet what he thinks is a cat and something grabs his arm instead a hand grabbed his wrist and as he, he described it and he blacked out again and then the third night he he saw a tall gray alien in his room, six foot tall one, the, you know, the taller ones. And um, he said he stared at it for just a moment. It stared back at him. And then the next thing he knew, it blacked out again. He blacked out. Yeah. So this is why we think it's it's um, the alien abduction phenomenon that plagued the whole family. But it took us a while to figure that out. We had to start comparing notes with each other because um, Steve has not been able to break through um we've tried some hypnotic regression but uh we haven't been able to break through the memory block yet it's a different it's a difficult thing with hypnotic regression i have been hypnotized very effectively once when i was not on my 19th birthday but so we know he can be hypnotized yeah but, but but giving up that you know i don't you know i don't, I don't want to have false memories in, in you know implanted in me and and also, you have to trust a person. They also have to believe you in the first place. Yes, and you have to build the therapy. And you have to build a pony. You have to build <laughs> a pony. You. you have to build pony up the money, you know, yeah. to build to have it done. And uh, I would, I would you know. For me, like I said uh, recently, I said that I much rather just have them meet with me and just say, "Hey, this is what we want of you and your family. We're we're not really." Uh, your family spirit guide we're basically your your alien handlers and we've been taking care and watching over your family for at least three generations but just come clean with me just let me know i would rather not have to go through hypnotic regression but you know it's yeah, just, but they're not forthcoming very. yeah they're not <laughs> very forthcoming so yes. anyway well it's, I, I was gonna say yeah i was my my best guess with obligly is not he's not a a family spirit guy that sounds like an alien portraying itself as something else in yes. order to make you guys feel safe because as my understanding and my own spiritual journeys and stuff like that uh spirit guides are associated to one individual person not a group of people right. now it might follow you through many of your lives but that person will change vessels throughout your time um but that's past life stuff but yes, it's, yes. it's not like it sounded like it was following your family specifically did you guys ever figure out why it wanted your family specifically that's really, really a good question. And I, I wanted to kind of highlight as far as this old Glegley character manifests used to, I, I, I thought old Glegley was, I was told old Glegley was a very tall, slender black man from Tunisia that wore a red hat, a red fez. And in fact, my uncle who, who's passed, 
who told me about an experience that he had. He was of a, of a, he was Griffiths. Um, you buried my my mom's older sister, and he uh, O'Gleggly saved his life in oh, Ceylon, which is now Sri Lanka, uh, just after World War II. But O'Gleggly manifested as this tall, black, slender, about six six and a half feet tall, uh, uh foot tall, of uh, a black man. So when I met O'Gleggly when I was eighteen. I uh, manifested as a tall, blue-white entity, tall, skinny, and um, not menacing, but paralyzed me. And uh, as as a result of that meeting in the morning of January uh, at the Faubourg House, all the coins that were in my pocket on the right-hand side of my pocket were magnetized. So six hours later, when I went to go uh, to get lunch for my dad and I, because we we're cabinet makers, and I just reached into my pocket and I pulled out the coins that were in my pocket. And they these are all standard American coins, and they were all magnetized. I could pick up the coins. My dad could pick up the coins. It didn't matter from the edge, from the, from the face. They were all still magnetized. And it was only because, th again, this was like a cluster of five events, five nights in a row, that stuff happened and each one got a little more intense. Um, my sister experienced it. My dad, I definitely experienced it. I was, uh, I was like the target. I think the main target I was um, right. harassed so. more than anybody was in the family. My dad saw some things and, and my sister, her, and, you know, have you ever read any of uh, Dion fortune's work of uh, psychic self-defense She's a famous famous psychic from from Great Britain from like the turn of the century. She wrote I've, that book, Psychic Psychic Self Defense. I've heard a few things. My wife actually read, I think, read a few things on on him. We mostly get all our our learnings from uh, Dolores Cannon, but um, other ancient ways of yeah. protect. But yeah. yeah, she yeah. Well, she it was interesting because um, I had a friend way way back in 1981 that did some research, and he said you should read this book because. One one night, I had given my dad this book to read uh, by Paramahansa Yogananda about metaphysical meditations, and I just gave it to him casually. He said, Dad, you should read some of this stuff. And about a half an hour later, he came into my room with this perplexed look on his face, saying, Stephen, I'm hearing, I'm hearing a silver bell. And I said, okay, Dad. So I walked into the living room, and sure enough, there was the sound of a silver bell being rung inside the two by four wall by the fireplace. And we were just looking at each other and said, that's not possible. It, it can't be a squirrel. I mean, they don't have silver bells. So we got my sister who was a born again Christian at this time and 13 years old. She didn't want to have anything to do with this kind of stuff, but she said, where's that silver bell coming from? <laughs> she could hear and it so too. like we banged on the wall, looked up the, the chimney and the flue and it went on for a good 10 or 15 minutes. And then it just quit. Now, I later was told that apparently by, according to Dion Fortune, that a spirit or an entity that is not quite strong enough to be able to manifest itself visually will manifest with the sound of a silver bell. It's in her book, Psychic Self-Defense. The funny thing was, is that the house that Wesley was talking about that we were building 350 miles away in California, uh, my mom, we talked to her that the next day in the morning, my mom said that, you know, she said, Jeffrey, you know, you, 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 I, you know, the phone rang. I heard this bell ringing and I picked up the phone and there was this voice of a man on the other line saying, I am the invisible on beachy or something like that. And my brother said, Stephen, the phone didn't ring, but mom did pick up the phone. And so they were experiencing the same phenomena at the, the same too. time that we were experiencing. So all five of us experienced this silver bell phenomena. And it was just like, you know, for a long time, a long time I thought, oh, it's some type of a paranormal thing that it's it's the family spirit guy. But when you have coins in your pocket magnetized and it's a blue white light energy bearing being paralyzes your body and says, yeah, whisper in your ear. ear. <laughs> and uh, it's just like, you know, and fills the whole room up with this intense blue light, white light. I decided when I hit about 30, I said, I've got to really start to do some research into this because it's just not adding up, you know? So it, it, there is some type of a connection or a crossover as far as I'm concerned between the alien phenomena and the paranormal. 
And our research shows that um, it tends to be, at least in the United States, most of our research was done in the United States. Uh, mostly, uh, most of the people who are abducted here are uh, Caucasian. And uh, there are a disproportionate number of green-eyed people taken and a disproportionate number of RH negatives people are taken. And uh, the Basque population in Europe, they're, um, they are, they have the highest rate of RH negative in their bloodlines. And we're not sure, so Basque people are disproportionately taken as well. We're not sure if they're after the RH factor more and therefore they're taking more Basques or they're after Basques and therefore getting more RH negatives. We're not sure which uh, criteria. Yeah, the chicken or the egg thing, yeah. And a lot of the people we've interviewed are claimed to be psychic people. So it seems like that's part of it too. And we know they communicate with their abductees telepathically. And we believe that uh, telepathy is a human uh, power or ability that has kind of atrophied in us over time and can be opened up again and can be utilized if if you do the uh, chakra opening work and the kundalini raising work. Um, Stephen was a, a Tai Chi teacher, very young. He mastered it very young. And as you know, Tai Chi is a moving meditation and mm -hmm. just doing Tai Chi regularly and all the martial arts he was doing uh, made, you know, opened his chakras a lot. And he had the a lot of these psychic abilities very young in life. Go ahead and tell him. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I already I already had them. I kind of inherited them from my mom's side of the family. But I, I always knew there was a lot more out there. And the nice thing about Tai Chi was that I had a very good teacher and he taught me to you know, read the Tai Chi classics, read what these old masters had done, read how you stimulate the Chi and what Chi means and about the chakra type stuff. And sure enough, when I did the work and I actually practiced Tai Chi in Qigong, literally you do start to feel the Chi. It's like it starts out like this warm, warm water sensation coming up your arms into your hands. And then you're just filled with this energy that comes through the bones and then you just literally it's effortless you literally it's almost like the room becomes filled with energy and you can actually feel it so this is like something tai chi just enhanced my natural abilities i just i already had this i just didn't know what it meant until i had a teacher that kind of helped me to direct you know uh me in 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 my in my life and it was very very helpful uh, for sure. I mean, I became an acupuncturist, state license got acupuncturist for 20 years, and I treated dogs, cats, and humans. Um, you know, it just really, you know, gave me a good pathway in life, quite frankly. And when we were researching the abduction phenomenon, at first we thought, uh, like many people thought, that the aliens are just interested in us scientifically. They just want a few samples, no big deal. They take you, put you know, take their samples and put you back. Um, and they want a cross section of humanity. They want to, uh, you know, from people from all different races and walks of life. But this turned out not to be what was really happening. When we started researching it, we discovered that um, what happens is, is that the aliens find a specific bloodline that they want, a specific line of genetic uh, genetics or DNA that they're after. Material, yeah. And once they find them, they they put trackers in them. And they take them regularly. Uh, every few months, they would abduct them again and again and again and again through their whole lives. And then their children would start being taken. And then their grandchildren would start being taken. It seems to me that they're after a particular line of DNA. And once they find it, they prey on that for, for generations. And that's what we think is going on with his family. You, you probably have some questions at this point, I bet. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was just was curious on the idea that um, people, alien enthusiasts, the ones I've talked to at least, they they, they say there's more than one alien race here that's uh, either trying to rule us, trying to help us, or trying to harvest us, and there's different alien species. Which alien species would be the one that essentially is bothering or saying harvesting, doing this this kind of particular choice with just the, uh, the white white race of, of people in America specifically? And uh, the stranger situation the question is why just caucasians why just white people why not any other race is there something different mm -hmm. that caucasians have versus everyone else other than the lack of melanin in their skin 
Well, um, our theory is quite different from a lot of people's beliefs in this matter. We don't think that these are alien races coming from all different solar systems and planets. We think instead that the, um, the Nordic aliens are a branch of the human race that split away from us thousands and thousands of years ago and have mutated since then. Um, as you know, probably from talking to people, the Nordic aliens are almost indistinguishable from regular hum human beings. Uh, they're, except they look like Nordics, you know, tall Swedes, say, you know, they're white haired and blue eyed and tall. Is that where they got the name? I'm sorry? Is that where they, they got the name? The name, yeah, the Nordic aliens, I think so. And also, um, uh, Bird described them as having Nordic accents or Germanic, Germanic, Germanic accents. accents. Actually, that's what he said. He said Germanic or Nordic accents. Okay. Exactly. Right. So, um, and then uh, we think these other races, so to speak, are the evidence of the um, the Nordics genetic Gen modification program. Yes. Exactly. We think they utilize genetic modification just like we use any tool. And let's say they need underwater beings to do a bunch of work down in, in underwater bases. They might breed the reptilians. Or if they need super strength, they might breed Bigfoots. And if they need... Uh, uh, more dispassionate type of handlers like the greys like the greys we think they have taken an underground race of humanity um because when i look at a gray alien as far as you know the rare pictures or the drawings of them what i see is a human being uh you know they they're closer to us than anything else on our planet they walk upright like us they have deltoids clavicles <laughs> elbows uh, everything bending the same way um, at a distance, when people see them, they think they're they're humans. They're they move like what like we do, like large children or and, young children, and they stand perfectly upright, unlike anything else on our planet. And uh, they look like they've been underground for a long time, like they've gotten bigger eyes and bigger pupils and uh, grayer, paler skin, and they don't need hair anymore to protect them. Uh, so we don't see these as coming from, you know, this race from Alpha Centauri and this race from the Pleiades and that race from the so and you know, all over the place. Plus, that explains how they can breed with the so easily. Right. Too. Yeah, they're very, you know, our closest <laughs> relative right now that we know of on this planet is the bonobo chimp, which is about 99 percent the same as us. But that one percent makes a huge difference. Yeah, but and and even though they're so close to us genetically, they're they're nothing like us. They have nothing like the kind of uh, thinking power that we have. They don't stand perfectly upright. When they're frightened, they run away on all fours and take to the trees. Uh, they're really quite different than us. And we have a lot more in common with, say, the greys or the reptilians or and, the Yeah, and plus human beings. You know? we, we, we know that you know, human beings make terrible slaves. <laughs> we just are, we, we're, we, we are a rebellious bunch. And uh, if you want to have a slave race or you know servants, whatever, you mm -hmm. certainly would want to have ones that are just, if you have the ability, like, you know, we're playing around with CRISPR technology right now and AI. We're playing, you know, we're playing around with like, you know, curing uh, certain types of blindness and bringing back the woolly mammoth. So we're, we already know how to do this stuff because the human genome is only four base pairs. So it's really pretty easy when they figure it out. So, so they can cut and paste. That's really what CRISPR is. So if you have, if you have a head start of a few thousand years, probably playing with genetics would be just like playing with uh, building blocks for us. So you know, easy. So we tried to look into the past and to determine when our races could have separated. And um, what we looked at specifically was the uh, the extinction events of 13,000 years ago and the Great Flood. Uh, one of my backgrounds I, I didn't mention, but I, I studied ancient art history in college. That was my minor. And um, one of the books I read during that time period was Fraser's work about all the different flood myths. Uh, worldwide. In uh, the 1700s, this guy named Fraser wrote this book, and he had isolated 500 separate cultures around the world that had a flood myth in their past. And uh, since then, there have been a lot more discovered. So there's more like 1,200. Yeah, separate. Hancock <laughs> Hancock, Hancock found some more gray man. And uh, like Silvius has done some work on it. Yeah. And there, uh, there's it's evident that a flood really happened, a wa worldwide shared experience really did occur. And 
the the um, extinction events of 13,000 years ago is where I started focusing my research. And sure enough, um, about three decades ago, they discovered nano diamonds in the soil of 13,000 years ago, up around the Labrador uh, Sea in the northern hemisphere, north north uh, the North American hemisphere, but the e the northern east side of it. And um, these nano diamonds form in no other way except a celestial impact of some kind. Um, and at first I was looking at the Hiawatha crater, uh, but that turns out to have been a 48 million year old event. But um, since then, they've discovered the younger Dryas comet remains in um, the uh, Lake Superior in Lake Superior area, which would have been when it hit 13,000 years ago. Yeah, actually, it would have been part of the ice sheet. Right. Exactly. 12,850 years ago. Yeah, that that one is dated to the right time period. And um, it wiped out the uh, Clovis people, the woolly mammoth, the mastodon, the dire wolf, the saber tooth cat, the American camel, the American horse. The stilt bear, a, a lot of animals just wiped out all at yeah. the same time. And some were able to hang on yeah, the, a bit longer. But the mammoth ground sloth uh, uh, hung on to life for about 3,000 more years, but also eventually died out. Um, and we think that this event may have been the catalyst for our race to separate and um, into two. And half of the, you know, some of the race, uh, escaped the cataclysm and with their technology and their knowledge intact and their spiritual you know upbringing their you know everything wasn't lost your civilization their civilization in fact entire civilization wasn't lost they uh saved it but we on the surface we who were left behind on the surface we were just almost wiped out to a man down to about 10,000 individuals there's a genetic bottleneck that happened 13,000 years ago where the uh basically we, uh, the our, the 8 billion people on the planet right now have uh, all regenerated generated from, from 10,000 10, which, which is not that diverse really right so, so. It, that's one of the reasons that even though we're a, a very large quantity uh, population we are not actually genetically very diverse at all and this is wise because we were almost wiped out. And so these beings that separated away from us, they are 13,000 years at least more advanced than we are because they kept their technology. But we got shoved back into the Stone Age and had to start over, basically. The tale of the haves and the have nots. <laughs> <laughs> so we think it was kind of a, a deep impact thing, like the movie, right? Uh, the president says... Oh, uh, well, we're going to send astronauts to blow up the asteroid. And if that works, great. But if it doesn't, we have plan B. And plan B was to dig these arcs underground, uh, deep underground, and, you know, put our, our brightest and best people down there. And all our technology would go with them and our culture would go with them and we wouldn't lose ourselves. We, we humanity would survive. Yeah. One thing that really kind of led us led us to this uh, belief is that in all these flood myths, one there's one commonality is that they all had foreknowledge and forewarning. Yeah. So if you have foreknowledge and forewarning of a year or two, you have to have at least a partially developed space program. And, uh, and and advanced astronomy, yeah, certainly. Yeah, exactly. In fact, we think that humanity may have been a spacefaring race before this this asteroid hit. And some of the, I mean, a comet, rather, it was the Younger Dryas comet. Uh, we think that some of them escaped into space. And uh, that's what these bases on Mars are. That's what these bases and structures on the moon are. And Mars, on Phobos, yeah. the pho uh, moon, one of the moons of Mars has a, a tower structure on it that is obviously not natural. It's a, it's, I want to say man-made or, and, and man-made because if it's us that built it from prior to the impact, that would mean that they're, they were an advanced race, um, possibly a little more advanced than we are now when the astro, I mean, the uh, comet struck and, shoved all the rest of us back into the stone age where we all had to start over again and a lot of these flood myths they have a, an after story that are remarkably the same from yes. one to the next to the next to the next is that after the flood waters receded and there were some scattered survivors these scattered survivors just reverted back to barbarism and cannibalism 
And a lot of these myths talk about a god coming to them, teaching them civilization again, animal husbandry, crops, growing crops, uh, math, architecture. All of these skills were given back to us. And I think this is the evidence that these people that survived it kind of took pity on us poor slobs on the surface and uh, returned as these pantheons of gods. They returned to Egypt as Osiris and his family, right? They returned to uh, Greece, Greece and, and we have Zeus and his group, you know, and yeah. uh, and then um, you got Babylon. And then the Indus Valley in India, they have their pantheon of, of gods. And the Sumerians have their pantheon China, of gods. China, Guangdi, Neijing. And we think that they they came back to the surface. But because they were so far advanced ahead of us, they just came back as gods. But gods that can have sex with us and make babies. <laughs> you know, to this day, they're still doing That's it. That's right. That's right. Like... You know, a lot of these abduction phenomena where they're they're actually got this bizarre breeding program with us where they're making hybrid beings. Right. Um, and I thought at first when I was researching, I was going to find a lot of in vitro fertilization techniques or, you know, that where they're genetically modifying uh, the the babies that they're impregnating into the women. But no, they're just having sex with us and creating babies. And. They, in order to be able to do that, they have to be us. Or somewhat kind of version of us. Right. And yes, exactly. They have to be close enough for sure. The oldest flood story that I know of, because I research a little bit in histories, so I've been searching for answers associating with my ability, and, and my listeners know exactly what I'm talking about. But you guys, like I said, we'll talk about it afterwards because I know it'd be too long to talk about now. But one of the things I've learned about with the oldest story so far told is what we know about the Mesopotamians and ancient Sumerians and stuff right. like that. As far as the only recorded, oldest recorded history we have. And right. they talk about the flood story with the Epic of Gilgamesh and, and, and stuff like that. Right. So it tells me that that if wasn't the original, or at least that's the oldest for story we have. And everything right. after took kind of, you know, hey, that story I heard before, let's copy it and paste yes. it to our kind of thing. Kind of influencing the idea. Right, that story could have spread out from a certain amount of time, but that story, uh, the the city, I forgot where the name of the city was, that um, um, Gilgamesh was uh, the king over for a city period of time. Was it yeah, her? That's the one. Yeah. And which is now modern day Iran or Iraq, somewhere in between that area. Um, but that 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 tracks with um, genealogist studies of where the human race started, which we've all started in Africa. And we right. kind of spread out through that continent going further and further out from each other. Hence why, you know, we get the different races because we all started at one. We all kind of spread out. And then, of course, our bodies naturally uh, adapt to our surroundings. So, you know, right. our you use pigmentation for less sun. You lose melanin in certain parts of the world. We spread out across. And then right. that's how kind of we started. For 10,000 people starting in Africa, that like, makes sense of how we all kind of started there. And then we started spreading out over thousands and thousands of years. But it's... I don't, I don't chalk aliens, um, or particularly as God's aliens, entire influence with humanity, saying that's the only reason why we are so we were technology advanced. How we were able to build pyramids, have all the technology and intelligence we have, could they play a major part? Major, I don't know, minor, probably. But um, there are civilizations that exist all across the world. And were able, capable of high mathematics, say the Aztecs, for example. Right. Their their intelligence, their their um, their way of understanding how you know everything worked and had how they built their own pyramids was on rival with the Greeks, but yet they never get any kind of credit for it because they were conquered. Um, but when it comes to the Greeks and stuff like that, how they understood architecture, even the Egyptians, which right. we still debate to this day, who built the pyramids? Was it people? Was it was it aliens? Uh, I, I, this, to say that. We had major technology in the past. Yeah, that makes sense. Same yes. goes for, did they, ancient Egyptians, before the actual Egyptians, maybe in between the Mesopotamia and the Egyptian era, did they have a certain form of technology that we lost that maybe well, involved sound or psychic abilities? Yes, certainly it's possible. The um, Zachariah Sitchin, who we get a lot of our 
source for the Anunnaki and the Sumerian uh, information comes from his work and his translations mostly. And a couple other sources. There's a couple other sources too. But um, Sitchin makes an excellent argument um, in his book, The uh, Twelfth Planet, that the Egyptian pyramids, the Giza Plateau, were built by the Sumerian god, Anunnaki god, Enki, who was the great builder of the early Sumerian peoples. The ziggurats were his work, and uh, uh, supposedly he had put locks on the Nile, actual damning locks on the Nile at some point, which have since been destroyed, of course. But um, he was supposed to be their great builder, their great thinker, their their their, their greatest scientist. And... Um, after the flood, according to Sitchin, after the flood and all of the works of the Sumerians um, were destroyed by the, uh, the waters, they decided to move one of their um, uh, the triangles of their triangulation for a space flight. In order to, to guide a ship down from space, you need to have a triangulation of, of beacons to cross over towards the, each other. And according to Sitchin, uh, in about the year 10,000, Enki built the Giza Plateau, uh, all of the, the pyramids, uh, with their you know highly superior knowledge that they didn't lose when the uh, flood happened. And um, that's why it's such a superior... Uh, all the following pyramids that came later were like just mankind trying to emulate the gods and their works at Giza. But Giza is... Be above and beyond what anything that these pri these primitive people were supposed to have been able to build, they they attributing the pyramids to a copper tool society, not even bronze, and you, you know uh, the Great Pyramid is lined with rose quartz, a seven inside. a seven on the Moh scale, and uh, you know if you t you can take a copper tool or a bronze tool for that matter. And whack it on on uh, rose quartz all day, and you'll just wreck the tool. It's way too hard for these people to have been able to shape it, and not just shape it, shape it with uh, absolute machine precision. Uh, it's it's ridiculous to, that they're attributing this to this uh, this culture of copper tool using people. It's just absurd. No. And and you know the way they talk about the pyramids being built, there's 2.3 million blocks in the Great Pyramid alone. You would have had to put in the 20 years they claim that it took them to build it. You would have had to put a block in place every 14 seconds for it to actually be able to build it in this 20 year period of time. And we're talking about people, and they say, oh yeah, they rolled them up these ramps with uh, with logs. There's no hardwoods in Egypt. Uh, these are all softwoods. Uh, there's no way it would have just crushed the the logs of the era. No tailings no. pile either. And in where's the the ramp? Where did the ramp go? You the know, tailings pile, <laughs> the yeah. tailings pile. And it's not there. So it's it's madness to think that. And and you know, like I said, when I was studying ancient art history, and this was the theory that they were proposing. It just kept not making any sense. And then I read Sitchin's work and he attributed it to the more advanced peoples prior to the, the uh, cataclysm. And then it suddenly it made sense because they had the technology. They had the ability. And they didn't lose it. Yes. Right. And these, your experiences, um, Stephen, and then your study of uh, the ancient histories in the past and everything's not adding up, is these, both of you guys... Uh, experiences together is what you guys led what led you guys to write the book yeah we're a good team that way i i'm a journalist and um so a writer and uh steven um is is our primary experiencer of the phenomenon i, I did dabble in writing i took uh you know college level courses i did write a short story but she is definitely the uh and more he, qualified to write than me but he wrote um his family's histories into our book as well so that's why we're co-writers and um we're both co-researchers we've done you know frequently i would come up with something i'd say steve i need this this particular subject research you're on it <laughs> i've been i've been, he would go I've been searching it. i've been searching for the vast uh, vast majority of my life to mm -hmm. get my own personal answers 
So for me, it's been like right. closer to a lifelong journey for me. It's, it's like I say, it's not something I talk to my my friends with when I was in elementary school or even junior high because they think either that I was nuts or that I was living in a haunted that house weird, yeah. <laughs> or I was just my family was weird or something like that. My my family came from wartime England as it was. So we were always uh, kind of a little bit uh, people that said conservative and we didn't have a lot of friends over. So, you know, we were very much like, you know, family first type of uh, situation. And you Stephen know. has, um, he was a, a retired, he's a retired acupuncturist now. He was for 20 years in the medical Chinese medicine field. And um, he has a much more uh, scientific. Uh, I know the education. brain very, I know the brain very well. He has a more scientific education than I do. And I needed, I needed that extra knowledge for all of the geology, trying to understand the, uh, the comet and the, uh, the asteroid impacts and uh, the, the effects on the work, the planet. And also on the uh, the changes to the human brain that we surmise happened uh, roughly three hundred thousand years ago. The the Anunnaki claim this is it's not like Sitchin and us making this stuff up, right? He was he actually well, translated the the uh, the uh, Sumerian tablets to find that the the Anunnaki possibly uplifted humanity the human race from homo erectus to homo sapien about 300 year thousand years ago and um steven's research showed that this actually may have really happened according to jason martell at uh one of the recent uh disclosure events i went to he's He's involved in a lot of the more of the scientific part of uh, what's been going on and it looks like at least that's when we can find now the neocortex, which is the most recent part of the human brain of Homo sapiens sapien, it appears that uh, that there was tampering done about 300,000 years ago in the area close to Broca's brain, which is the speech centers. And so it looks like there was a cut and paste, kind of like what we do, except this cut and paste was done on the inside of the neocortex, which is about the thickness of cardboard. OK, but that separates us. But the frontal cortex and the neocortex and Broca's brain that separates us from Homo sapien, make us Homo sapien sapien, gives us the ability to be able to like read blueprints. You know, you cannot make the pyramid unless you can have language and you have to be able to write down on a blueprint. And you have to have a plan, mathematics, architects, and you have to have, uh, uh, you know, the knowledge of astronomy how to put it in the, the four cardinal points. None of these things could have been done without advanced mathematics and language. That's what a lot of people don't get. Right. And it infuriates me when I hear Egyptologists <laughs> keep on saying that this was done just with logs and elephants and a long ramp. For what purpose? For what friggin' purpose? Yeah. You know, it would have taken a million years to build it that way if it were possible. At yeah. All. They were yeah. building it during when they still had a rainy season, too. Yeah. They're, 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 you know, when the Nile was still flooding, they didn't have a, a 24 7, 365 building season. I mean, you can see that with the erosion patterns on the Sphinx. Right. So it's like, you know, no, no, it wasn't built in 20 years. And Khufu had nothing to do with it. As far as I'm concerned. And also 10,000 years ago, we were just entering the procession time, um, the you know astro astronomical time of Leo, which makes sense why you would put a sphinx out in front of your big pyramid complex, right? Um, and we're just now entering the, the age of Aquarius, right? And procession takes thousands of years to, to, to uh, go through. But um, it looks like the time of Leo is 10,000 years ago when we, uh, when Sitchin claims that Enki built the, uh, the Giza plateau and, um, uh, post, post, uh, post flood. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and, guys... uh, they're not tombs. They're not tombs. <laughs> I was about to ask it. What do you guys believe in your own personal belief or maybe theorize or what you guys have found that the pyramids were built for? Oh, they, they, I'm sure they serve multiple purposes, as well as uh, power generation, communication, maybe even um, beacons, uh, beacons, or maybe even like uh, especially the sarcophagus in the the king's chamber. It may have been a um, uplifting tool itself, and it might expand consciousness. They found a lot of what are called mono monoatomic earth elements all outside of the uh, 
these little white particles that are they're monoatomic they're single single atom earth elements and they they can be generated in fact i have a friend that uh, did body harmony for years and one of the things when a group of people get together and get into certain types of meditation they start to form these little white fine powders on their bodies and they actually form monoatomic earth elements they surround which, the sarcophagus right and the, and the sarcophagus was was surrounded with monoatomic earth elements but one thing we like is the um uh christopher dunn wrote this fascinating book called uh, the pyramid power plant mm -hmm. and we think that this actually makes a lot of sense um first of all he has a lot of he has some really good evidence for it it uh one of the uh little shafts that go down into the i forget the name of the lowest chamber down there uh, and uh i think it's the king's chamber and these two shafts the two shafts one comes from one side one comes from the other side one's got um hydrated zinc i need the science person here more one day they found they found uh found hydrated zinc in one of the uh one of the, uh, one of the canals, shafts. one of the shafts, and the other one was basically muriatic acid or hydrochloric acid. And if and... you mix these two things together, like we think they did inside this uh, enclosed chamber, like a hot box, and and you cause um, uh, any any kind of excitement to it, it creates um, hydrogen gas, and we think that it rose up into the upper chamber, the big chamber, and. Um, uh, Christopher Dunn said all you would need is some devices in there to excite the, the uh, molecules further. And he said you can actually create x-rays with this. Yeah, microwave technology. Microwave basically. technology. Mm -hmm. And he thought, um, Sitchin believes that they were using the pyramid as a beacon, a space beacon, and that they had one on top of Mount Ararat, another on top of Mount, um, uh, what's the one? Mount Sinai? The Sinai, uh, Mount Sinai. Yeah. Uh, or Mount Catherine, which was right next to that one. And um, and then the other one, they needed a third triangulation for uh, the, great, the, the Great Pyramid. And and the third wheel, the third hub of the uh, triangle was in the middle of nowhere, a big flat area that didn't, even, didn't have any mountains. Right. So he said they built this, the pyramid as a, as a third machine. beacon for for triangulating down from space. As part as part of its part of its uh, usages, you know. Interesting. Now, um, I know you guys study aliens as being in the physical, but have you ever studied aliens an idea of interdimensional? Right. Uh, we, we, we have <laughs> we have we have mixed feelings on that uh, right. from the standpoint that yes, I we do we do believe that uh, that there is a paranormal aspect and we do, I do know there's different vibrational frequencies. Like when I talked earlier about my being able to listen to different radio stations and, you know, that kind of stuff without a radio station being on, you know, you know, the, the brain can be tuned differently. You know, right now we're at 40 brain wave cycles per second because we're in beta in beta wave uh, of frequency right now. Cause we're, we're on a, you know, we're on visual media, but when like with Tai Chi, you basically bring down, your uh, brainwave frequencies are between about uh, like about eight and fourteen cycles per second, kind of into an alpha state. And then below that, you got your theta. Then you got your deltas that get down into the two and four cycles, which means that different aspects of your brain are tuned differently. That's why sound and vibration and chanting are so integral and important, important to the development of the complete human being and the complete human uh, brain. So literally, we can tune ourselves in, and that makes us more receptive to the idea of interdimensional uh, beings or communicating with, you know, let's say, like, like instead of listening to like radio, uh, r radio station 97.1, maybe some of us can listen to like 98 or 97.6, you know, it's just basically tuning a little different, like the shamans could do, they can hear they're not hearing voices. They're hearing different communication. But, but it's all that we have. But this we is have more that. of a psychic phenomenon or, or the psychic abilities of human beings, not so much interdimensional travel, say. And one of the things we like about our theories, or at least I like, <laughs> is that it doesn't require any theoretical physics to be true. Um, it doesn't require faster than light travel. It doesn't require um, wormholes. It doesn't require interdimensional travel. It doesn't require time travel. 
it's all physics that we can understand right now. In the ancient times, these beings that um, that were traveling around our planet in in rocket ships, um, they were uh, maybe the Anunnaki. We're not. We weren't there. We can't be sure. But we think that they um, built these different cities all over the world with the same kind of pyramids prior to the the uh, the uh, comet impact. So when you go to a new location, the first thing you do is you build a pyramid quickly. That's now your power source. And from that power source, you can you can um, set up the rest of your society on do all the rest of your building. And maybe that is why there is these pyramids that look like the same hand constructed them all around the world. And we think that's that they set up, like I say, a power plant and possibly a communication tool. That's another thing you can do with microwave technology is communicate back and forth all around the world with these. So they may be communication tools. They may be beacons and they may be power sources, uh, according to or all three. Done. Yeah. And um, there was this work by Mark Carlotto that really inspired me. And Sitchin also uh, claims that the Anunnaki themselves were in the. Um, Peru and the Americas and uh, the uh, Suomon and the, uh, the Mexico area, and um, it seems like the like again the similar hand building the stuff these megalithic structures. That's another thing. Is like why you're a primitive Bronze Age person? Why would you build with two hundred ton blocks of andesite? Uh, Saxuaman is the biggest. Uh, the biggest rocks in their wall are 200 tons and they are andesite, which is um, almost as hard as granite. It's uh, in fact, it is as hard as the it granite. Is. It's, it's like seven, seven on, on seven the most scale most as well. Um, again, they wouldn't have been able to shape it with their bronze tools at all. And, and people yet, and people that we've met that have actually been to Saxuaman, which is above mm -hmm. the tree line, they say you wouldn't believe what it looks like if you're actually there physically. It's it's old, it's overwhelming. And you look at it from above, it actually looks like a uh, like a sluicing like a station. Sluicing station. <laughs> station. There's if you no... just ran a bunch of water through it, it would actually separate out heavy metals. Um, if you ran like a river through it or uh, large bodies of water, and it looked like it's somewhat Saksuman, there may have been a giant water tower there's a round area at the top that looks like it might have been the bottom couple of bricks of a of a giant water tower yeah yeah so it's 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 interesting but yeah as far as communication interdimensionals i i believe that we have the ability and we probably are uh being contacted by you know i think that's part of part of the whole paranormal thing is is Literally, like almost an interdimensional, not necessarily coming from a galaxy far, far away, but there's different frequencies and different sensitivities. And, you know, some people pick up on it more than others. That's all. And uh, Carlotto's work is fascinating. I don't know if you've read any of Mark Carlotto's books, but he um, he's a geo global positioning satellite positioning expert. That's his his. Um, uh, main focus is uh, that's his field. Yeah, and what he noticed from day one of looking at the alignment of, say, Teotihuacan, the the pyramids at Teotihuacan, they the base the the um, base of the structures do not align with the cardinal points like the pyramids do. They instead align to the cardinal points when the North Pole was in a different location at the Hudson Bay, right in the East Hudson Bay, when the North Pole was there, uh, according to Hapgood, the guy with the lithospheric shift theory, um, and we know that the North Pole has shifted around several times, and the uh, it would have been in the East Hudson Bay between twelve and eighteen thousand years ago, and um, if it was the uh, the uh, pedestals i mean uh what, what the uh the uh underneath everything you know the uh the foundation the found thank you the foundations of the structures uh they align with the cardinal points right at that the uh the old pole location the previous pole location so yes. he thinks carlotta thinks that the foundations of these uh cities were built 
more than 12,000 years ago when the the uh they would have aligned perfectly to the the uh the cardinal point Bay. at that time and uh all of the cities in in Mexico around Teotihuacan all of the uh pyramid structures all of them line right up with the cardinal points where they were uh 12 to 18,000 years ago and we think the younger dryas comet when it struck actually caused this lithospheric shift remember between 12 and 18,000 years ago this comet hit and uh 12,850 years ago to be exact and we believe it caused a lithospheric shift at the same time and that would have made it even the cataclysm even worse it would have um, added to this height of the tsunamis uh, and literally oceans would have been ripped from it would it would have been more apocalyptic for sure even more so yeah and so, we know that the layer of soil above the Younger Dryas boundary is, I mean, the Younger Dryas boundary is this 13,000 uh, to 12,000 year old layer of soil right after the impact that shows drastic climate upheavals. And that would explain why the surface persons that had survived were thrown back into the Stone Age so effectively. It's because the, the, uh, the climate upheavals would have made growing crops imp impossible. We would have been forced back into a hunter-gatherer type of societies. Now, what's interesting is that the Aborigines have been around in Australia for a long, long time, and you know, they're you know the the uh, the comet hit in the northern hemisphere, and it's quite possible that the Aborigines and, and in more in the southern hemisphere escaped some of the major uh major deleterious effects of the of the impact but yes the, the aborigines go back i think it's like 40 or fifty thousand years or something like that one of the few histories that goes yeah. back really goes you know it's, it's one of the oldest ones so yeah so people did escape but they talk about their star brothers you know it's funny, funny in fact you know the Ameri the the american indians who've talked to uh you know as we've gone or gone along talking to people they have a they have a totally different viewpoint they Look at them as being star brothers or star friends or the ant people, and they just they they look at them from the standpoint of not being like afraid like mm -hmm. a lot of people. They they see the aliens as being literally, friends and yeah, brothers, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, the star brothers. The reason I ask, um, because <clears throat> being a pro investigator for three years now and having my ability for the last three years and stuff like that, everything I've learned um, with doing these investigations, I've never had much experience with aliens. Granted, I've been out in the woods because I'm a place really I can investigate around here in certain parks and stuff like that. But my only real investigation that was the only time my most for profound alien experience, which I think you guys might find interesting. And I always wanted to, I wanted to hear your opinion since you guys have so much knowledge and surrounding it. So there's a park near where we live um, called Northeast Creek Park. Um, it's a giant open field about the size of a football field with a, a trail on the left side that goes semi-circle all the way around covered in, 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 uh, in trees. And we kind of had a, a lot of experiences while we were there, finding things in the woods, getting things to the spirit box, everything you can think of. Um, but one of our second times there, uh, we had an experience that made us think possibly – there could be alien activity here. And for everyone listening in this episode, most likely I'll explain that in our next episode, we talk about what the Collins elite, uh, which I'm sure you guys probably have your own opinions on them. Uh, but the experience that we had is that uh, I had a member of our team who very elder psychic. He, he had a, a long history with it. I called him the voice of the dead because when we did the SS method, there was no one better. Uh, so he blindfolded himself, put the headphones on, put the spirit box on, sat in the field and started tuning in. And I asked um, those who were here last that weren't here from this world, we want to communicate with you. And we just got, you know, over typical ghost stuff coming through. And then we heard static or sorry, Mike heard static in a very computerized tones. And then he heard they heard they he said this is him speaking but they're they're speaking through him what do you want to know i said were you the ones here the other night ago yes what where are you from not here what world are you from not world interdimensional and i said do you know who i am and they said yes ashwakanatanka 
And I said, what is your purpose here? To observe, to watch. And then it was something I guess Mike might have thought. And then he heard them say, oh, the source, pray to the source. It was not like they're telling me to do it. It was almost like a, you know, like a, this is said and that's said right after. Like the source, oh, pray to the source. Kind of like that kind of reaction. At least that's how he said it. Um, and then it, it went static again. And then it went back to dead. The sewer box was dead. And then me and my wife both witnessed on the opposite side of the field, so about 100 yards, in the tree line, this white ball of light shoot up that was so bright that we thought was a, a flare, like someone fired a flare up in the air. And it hovered there for a second and then fired off in the sky faster than I've ever seen before. That um, sounds like a, a UFO activity for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the first and last time we've had any kind of UFO experience um, anywhere we investigated. When we my sister, I want to jump in here. Um, sure. My sister uh, is currently using a spirit box and FLIR cameras and things such as that, and she's in, in communication with my uh, with my dead parents, my dead brother, and she contacts them on a fairly regular basis in in Great Britain. So she may be a good person to uh, talk about the spirit box thing, and uh, maybe in the future. Well, um, and and I can't speak to to ghosts so much but we've been researching this phenomenon the alien abduction phenomenon for many years and one thing we discovered is that when um when Stephen and i married we started doing uh he was already able to astral project and um he had already op done a lot of chakra opening work yeah but i had not and so i began doing tai chi with him and we started meditating and chanting uh, work that's meant to open the chakras. And as I did these this work, I was slowly able to gain the ability to astral project. And Stephen also was able, uh, he, his ability increased and he was able to astral project more. But one thing we discovered was that whenever I went astral, I had no, nothing bad happened. I would always, I had fun with it. I would go scuba diving without a scuba suit or i would go to egypt and see the pyramids but whenever stephen did it and i believe it's because of this connection to his alien handler it seemed like as soon as the veil came down into the astral realm they were there waiting for him they make these connections with humans and i think a lot of the voices that people are hearing through spiritualism are possibly them and they are waiting for us kind of psychically just on this other side of the veil and uh the fact that you saw one of these uh you say it was a round white light sphere kind of thing it was it was bright me and my wife both thought it was like someone in the woods firing up a flare gun that's how bright mm -hmm. it was but it only mm -hmm. went up so far like it shot up out of the woods floated for like maybe one to two seconds one we saw be able to look hey you see that to the sky that's um that's the same one we saw my first ufo steven's seen like three ufos in addition to all the other activity he's had i've seen five but we've but seen i mean three yeah. before we saw two together and so he's seen a total of five and i have um, i just seen the two but the first one i saw was a white ball of light very bright hovering above you know in front of us uh, we were driving i was driving and looking through the windshield and i thought it might be at first a plane but it didn't have the blinky lights like a plane would and it was just a white ball of light that got brighter and brighter and brighter and then it shot away at twenty thousand ish miles an hour and was gone over the northern horizon in less than a quarter of a second. It left like a little trail behind it, too. Like, yeah. Almost like a Star Trek effect. And it, it uh, like a line stretched out and the back of the line caught up to it. And within a quarter of a second, wasn't even a whole half second. Um, and the uh, during the last uh, hearings in on the congressional floor uh, last summer, when the two pilots were describing the UFOs they encounter, um, one of them, uh, Fravor, no, I'm sorry, it was Graves. Graves uh, was the one on the East Coast uh, flying with the Red Rippers out of Oceana. And he said that the these UFOs that dog them all over the time, all the time, are these 
clear glass spheres about 15 feet in diameter. And inside they have a cube, like a black cube or a gray, dark gray cube. And when these, when these craft are hovering, these cubes tend to spin very quickly. And that's why you'll see them up in the sky. Sometimes they'll flicker. Uh, if you're if you're looking at uh, UFOs online, you'll see this flickering. I'm talking about. Yeah, but I think I, I wanted to interject here as far as like the last uh, you, the last unidentified object that we saw together really kind of reminds me of what you were talking about, what you saw in your in the field there. What I saw with Leslie, it was almost like a greeting. It's almost like these entities knew that we had just moved to this house we moved to. And it was just literally within like a week after we actually moved here from where we were before, we just went out. We have a very, very small backyard. I mean, it's like the area of the sky that we can see from our backyard is like minus, <laughs> is minuscule. OK, so we happened to go out there just to enjoy the evening. And there was this, like you're describing, this intense white, kind of almost shimmery, but almost like like some sparks were coming off of it. And it was just like right there kind of like watching us and it started doing these weird movements impossible movements, you know yeah. soundless of course and then this took off to the north again it was almost like saying hey miles an hour. it was almost like to me i always interpreted it from the standpoint that it was like saying yes we know where you've moved to and we'll be keeping tabs on you and we weren't the only ones who saw it there's another couple that were living on the street where we still live and they actually saw it. a younger couple they saw it too at the same time i wanted to ask you are, are you anywhere near brown mountain uh, I'm in North Carolina, but Brown Mountain's on the opposite side of the state. Opposite side of the state. Uh, yeah. Brown Mountain is, we believe, one of these alien... Um, uh, they tend to do this. They tend to hollow out mountains. And then that mountain... And, and create their, their underground civilizations there. And then these mountains have all this UFO activity constantly around them. Like Shasta is a good one. Um, Mount Hayes. Mount uh, Denali, uh, Brown Mountain is another, um, Mussini in Italy. The Hudson Valley. And uh, we don't know which mountain they've hollowed out in the Hudson Valley, but of course the the Hudson Valley is famous for its its uh, UFO activity. And like you said, Mount Kailash, uh, we think there's a lot of these civilizations built into these mountains underground and where they would have been safe from the cataclysm. Uh, you know, you don't want to... you. If you want to go underground to survive a tsunami, you don't want to do it at low ground, right? Because the tsunami could end up leaving a lake on top of you, you know. But if you go into a volcano, um, the, an extinct volcano has a throat that goes almost all the way to the, the Earth's core. To the mantle, actually. And a lot of the, um, I mean, to the uh, through the crust, I mean. Yes, to the mantle. And then um, a lot of these these mountains have these enormous caverns, empty caverns inside of them because of the uh, lava flows, lava tubes. You know, sometimes they they're in long tubes and sometimes they open up into giant caverns. So if you wanted to transport a population to safety and you only have a limited amount of time to create this underground city. And you have the technology to basically finish the work like to make the make the tubes much bigger you know make the caverns huge right and also it's a very you know i used to be a cave explorer and you know wild cave exploring which is kind of dangerous and <laughs> believe me i can tell you that you know it's climate control down there it's uh you've got geothermal you've got water you've got there's a lot of things it's a yeah. lot safer you know the billionaires these days they're doing the same thing they're basically uh putting hundreds of millions of dollars into building their own fortresses underground, you know, with complete moats and lakes and the whole bit, you know, to make, to ride out a cataclysm. It's just, you know, again, it's the haves and the have nots, you know, mm -hmm. but. Uh, so I'm not sure if there is, if they have interdimensional abilities, maybe they do. Uh, we know they come through portals a lot. I see it as more like they're just able to negate matter and walk through it, walk through, because we see um, we see in, in a lot of the data that we've collected where um, people describe almost like a duck blind up on the mountain, it, like a hole opens up and all this light spills out of it and UFOs fly in and out of it. And uh, and then the hole closes back up again. Yeah, the uh, the Modoc Indians around Shasta talk about that quite a bit. And also uh, the... Uh, 
Hickory, Hickoria people the Hickory. Um, in uh, uh, New Mexico. And the Hopis talk about the ant. I hope I'm not butchering that pronunciation, but they, uh, they, uh, they're they, di different ones, like the Hopis talk about the ant people, you know. Right. And they, and the, in this, uh, the Archuleta Mesa, that's one of these places where they've seen the, like a, um, the door opens, light spills all the way out of the thing, and then it closes, and the UFO is flying in and out of it, and then it closes back up again. So, are they using interdimensional travel to do this kind of portal work through through solid matter? Uh, we can't be sure, but we don't think so. At least I don't think so. How do you think? <laughs> what do you think about it? <laughs> I'll remain mum on that. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I'm going out on a limb there, I think. Which is not experience, and the fact that they gave me that kind of information, um, if it was aliens I was speaking to to begin with, uh, but that light that I saw that kind of sealed it that it might have been because I've never seen that brightness of lights. I mean, I've seen yes. orbs, I've seen ghost lights and stuff like that, and they're very dim. But this, this caught my attention. This was yeah. like <laughs> I thought it was a flare gun. I was like, God dang, that's bright. Unless you when it's dark, there's no lights out there. I mean, there's a, a soccer field that's about maybe 150 yards out from where we were, but nothing like this. This was like in the middle of the, of the woods. There's no light source there. There's nothing. It's supposed to be a nature trail. There's nothing there. No electricity mm -hmm. whatsoever. Yeah, so for that kind of glass of light for it to be there, that really like, uh, am I talking to aliens? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I know. The, the one that we saw here in 2020, in October of 2020, we, we live out out in the boondocks of the desert in a in a little community but we live pretty far away away from the city okay and this thing just it, it had this this brightness about it like it was a flare like it was like a white flare intense white and it did it zipping around and like i say i got the uh, the feeling like it was like a being or an entity was saying hey Hi. Hi, Steve. We, hi, Steve. We know where <laughs> we you know are. We know where you are. We know you've moved. <laughs> I, I still I still have weird things happening to me, like uh, you know, I, like if I got out of my body the other night and I I didn't realize I'd gotten out of my body. I, I had to go to the bathroom about six o'clock in the morning and I was in the bed <laughs> and I just I just and I'm a two hundred fifty pound guy, so I don't just jump out of bed like I did when I was sixteen. So I, I got out of bed, you know, and just kind of jumped out of bed and went to the door to open it and I couldn't open the door. And I, I was getting frustrated. Then I said, oh, I'm so out of my body. So what I did, body in bed. <laughs> so I turned I turned around and I saw myself, my body still laying where it was. And I thought, oh, my God, did I just die or something? I said, oh, no, you're just out of your body. So yeah. I went over there and I kind of touched my body a couple of times. And I said, OK, I better get back in. So I laid back in my body. And then then I got up the usual way, the which was a little slow with, <laughs> with your body, with, yeah. with my body. So. It's a bit, see, I, I've had so many weird things happen. Like, for, for instance, for, for years, for decades, I would have, as I was getting to sleep, I would just be really starting to get really relaxed. And I'd always hear like this, this three knocks behind my head, like on the wall, like a knock, 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 wow. a series of three. And it would just like wake me up. Or what? sometimes it would be a door slamming or a plate glass window being broken, just like it was right in the room. And it's just like it was just like this harassment. And they like, have his psychic connection with him at all times, we think, but they can't come through unless he's in a relaxed state, like a, almost like an astral state. And the, the astral veil, as I said, comes down course. and then they're there like he's uh, what was the, the entity with the black entity with the gold eyes last oh, time? The most recent one. Yeah, this was very recent. He's still experiencing this a lot. I mean, I haven't had it since that time, but it was uh, I've, I've ex experienced this entity on several different occasions. The most recent one, it was this large, large black being with these golden eyes that. I woke in the bed and it was just like standing there just watching me. And I said, you know, what do you want? What do you want from me? Tell me what you want. I'd rather have them just basically say, Stephen, this is what we've been doing. We've been stealing your sperm for uh, five <laughs> decades and you've got kids all over the world that are hybrids. Yeah. But don't don't play these games with me anymore. I just want to know what you really want from me. And so Isaac, when I when I was first researching this stuff and finding out about the not only are they abducting people and stealing their genetic material, they've got this bizarre hybrid alien breeding program going on where they take women, impregnate them, 
through sex most of the time. And then the four months later, they steal the fetus. And then years later, they introduce them to their uh, frequently uh, introduce them to their yes, hybrid from, alien yeah. children. And um, I, I realized when I, I had to report on this for the book and I thought, God, could it be any weirder that if I if I made it up myself? But this this phenomenon has been documented again and again. And women are they're frequently their entire all their children are just stolen away this way. You know, they've been able to like verify this through uh, obstetricians. That's you know they say you, know, you were pregnant, and it, as far as I can tell from the ultrasound that you were never pregnant. Right. It's so like I know that everything. I know that your fetus was five centimeters large, and they just and sometimes they'll do it two or three or four times to a specific woman, and and then uh, sometimes occasionally they will be introduced to their their, their, their star children. Right, you know, have bigger eyes and whatever, and it's it's almost always in a telepathic manner, you know, where they don't actually okay. speak to their kids, but it's like they're talking, and I think that's that's one of these these latent abilities that human beings we actually have. It's like if you never do a pull up in your life, you'll never develop the muscle to do pull ups. Okay, you never get you know get your uh you know your uh your latissimus dorsi uh you know stimulated so that you can do pull ups. If you never practice you know uh, uh telepathy, you'll probably never be able to do telepathy unless you're taught how to do it and obviously if you're taught like before the age of five it'd probably be very simple and we think it's a human ability but that it has atrophied in us but not with them they have kept it up it's almost like it's not something you can ju you're just born with and do naturally it's something you actually have to work at you have to open the chakras you have to open these abilities up and we think that as a culture that they may have been doing this all along. Remember, we lost our culture. We lost everything about ourselves except our lives. Uh, but they didn't. They kept their technology. And when we were first looking at the phenomenon, we tried to, going through this mountain of data, it seemed like, and the theories were that these beings are coming here from distant star systems, uh, from all different Places that you know, Pleiades and Orion, and over here and over there, Sirius and Sirius, and but what we figured out, and we believe, has happened here in the old days, thousands of years ago, we were a primitive people, and they were playing God. They used to play God. You know, the, they'd come in these pantheons of gods, conveniently able to mate with us, though, se have a sex and have children with us. Uh, but they were playing gods, which would have been easy to do because they had this advanced technology. Now we think they're playing space alien. They're, um, we think that they're actually disseminating information, false information, out into our the ether of our consciousness. Linda Moulton Howe, for instance, uh, she talked at the last time we were at uh, uh, Contact in the Desert last June, uh, she spoke a, in detail about a, a meeting she had with a whistleblower who took her out on a boat and told her that we're actually part of a federation of all different planets and that they come from the white, tall whites come from there and the tall blues come from there and the, the, the grays over there and reptiloids over here and the felines over there and the insectoids over there. Right. So. Um, we don't think that's happening at all. We think that they are disseminating this fake information into our collective knowledge. One of the reasons we think it is uh, supposedly two of these starships that we're we're help we're traveling on with them for the past twenty one years happen to be named after two members of the Majestic Twelve. So why these d aliens from distant star systems supposedly are naming? <laughs> two of their starships after two generals from 1947, it makes obviously no sense. But if you wanted to dis if you wanted to disseminate information into the ufology community, Linda Moulton Howe is the person you leak it to because she's like the first lady of the ufology community where we uh, she's she's so famous that it would instantly. And of course, this is exactly what she did. But we think that it's all a big fake, that they're just trying to keep us looking up instead of looking instead down, instead of looking down under our yeah. feet. Right. And one of the things that I put in the book that I think is proof of this is the valiant Thor testimony. Supposedly, this this um, alien 
lands a spaceship in Virginia in, uh, I forget the exact date, but it was in the 50s. Mid 50s. And he um, out comes a Caucasian red haired man. White man. Yeah, human mm -hmm. being. And he was an advisor in the Pentagon for supposedly three years. And he claimed to come from Venus. And now we know, I mean, in the 40s, we didn't know this, but now we know that Venus is incapable of, of supporting uh, regular life like us. You know, I mean, maybe they can, it can, some, uh, you know, uh, impossibly tough bacteria live there, but nothing else. You know, they're, it's obviously a, Disinf a it's, dis it's disinformation. Right. We think it's a disinformation campaign that they are perpetrating um, as they slowly infiltrate our society with their hybrid beings that they're breeding. Yes, that's in a nutshell. <laughs> well, I feel like I can talk to you guys for for hours about this stuff. You guys are like unloading information. I, in the podcast world, we call this a day off where we don't have to continue the conversation. You guys fill it and with everything without... <laughs> um, with so much impartation, but um, we could probably go for another hour or so. But um, yeah, yeah. No. all great mm -hmm. information, all new ways of thinking about stuff, definitely. And I'm assuming majority of this is in your guys' book, correct? Yes, and uh, yes, more, so, of course, we, a lot. Yeah, we, we can't uh, talk about the entire book in uh, just yeah, we, one yeah. podcast. Yeah, we scratched the surface. Yes. Uh, um, can I uh, give us a shameless plug on our book again? <laughs> well, yes, I was going to say, where can everyone find the book? Um, <laughs> and where can... Okay you guys it's called um who they are and what they're up to by leslie and stephen shaw it's available on amazon and ingram books and uh, we also have an instagram page that we're working on trying to um disseminate stephen's more of a lot of his family's stories we've got like series of of stories and um we're also collecting um if, if people have experiences, please share them with us at our handle on Instagram, which is at Leslie Shaw dot. I'm sorry, Leslie dot Shaw dot author. And Leslie is spelled L-E-S-L-I-E -E dot S-H-A-W dot author. And our, and our Facebook handle is the same. And we have a website at who they are book dot com where there's some book excerpts and blogs and um also, we have, uh, you know, the links to any podcasts that we do. We post them there, too. Awesome. Well, I appreciate you guys coming on. Thank you for having us, Isaac. Thank you very much. As always, catch your weirdos in the next one. <laughs> <laughs>